And with that, I'm handing this over to Jim Fry, VP of Alliances at Kentech, who will be moderating today's webinar. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Kim, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Vice President of uh, Alliances for Kentech. I look after a lot of the you know, third-party relationships that Kentech has to be looking at and developing in order to you know, to really address the, uh, the shift in the market towards cloud native. And I think we've got some very interesting uh, topic space to cover today. Um, I wanna start by introducing our, our you know, key panelists here for, uh, for today's event, um, Avi Friedman, who's co-founder and CEO of Kentic, and Jonah Cowell, uh, who is a CTO of Kentic. Uh, Avi, why don't we give you a minute first to introduce yourself and just talk a little bit about your background. Sure. So hi, everybody, and thanks for joining. Um, I'm Avi Friedman. My background in networking goes back to uh, university days, uh, if you include uh, dial-up modems and things like that, back into the 80s. After I left university, there was no way to get dial-up internet access, so I started the first ISP in Philadelphia and then sort of specialized towards networking, inter-networking, um, through the 90s, uh, 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 and um, then wound up uh, running AboveNet, which was a big global backbone. And then I was at Akamai for 10 years, where we started, where one of the great attractions was software to define things instead of CLI and, and uh, manual orchestration, or as people were talking about at Cisco Live, finger-defined networking. And then after I left Akamai, worked in the cloud space, and then uh, heard the, the cries of people in the networking space uh, who were looking for better traffic visibility, especially with awareness of orchestration. And so that led me to start Kentic. Great, thank you. And then Jonah, can you give us a little background on yourself? Yeah, thanks, Jim, uh, and uh, happy to be here. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Jonah Cowell. I've uh, been with Kentic for just a few months, so I'm relatively new. I joined from App Dynamics. I was there for four years, uh, running various product and strategy areas, and prior to that, I was at Gartner for four years as well and uh, covered all of the monitoring and visibility spaces from infrastructure to applications. Uh, in my life before that, I was running IT operations, security and performance. So come from a practitioner background, uh, manage many teams from small startups to large enterprises and uh, really excited to, to be at Kentic as we uh, innovate and move forward and, uh, you know, particularly pay close attention to the ecosystem uh, as folks adopt new technologies. Uh, so thanks. Excellent. Thanks. Great. Looking forward to the discussion today. Here's some things we're going to cover. Uh, we've already done number one. We're on to number two. We're going to talk about cloud native and the impact it has on applications of the network. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about open source in networking, uh, we're gonna talk about the concepts of observability and monitoring, a little bit about automation. Then we're gonna give a little bit of sort of insights on the things that we've seen going on and that you know the Kentic team has been uh, observing at trade shows and, and in general in terms of trends. So let's jump straight into you know, the concepts of cloud native and the impact they're having, at least that we've seen uh, on, the, on applications and networking. You know, Avi, why don't you get us started, started off here when it comes to you know, this revolution or evolution towards cloud native approaches, you know, what kind of impact is that really having on, on applications? So it's been really exciting um, in the cloud native evolution has been seeing the democratization of orchestration, um, things that used to be done by the big five to 10 web companies that were done sort of internally to each company and differently be made available to everybody um, so that um, just as we're talking about moving away from CLI on the, uh, on the networking side or uh, typing on the sysadmin side from the application architecture and then through the operations and deployment, people can actually define and deploy and scale these things without human intervention. That's been really exciting um, uh, to see. And it's also really great because Having systems for that means that at least there's the promise of being able to take that data and make it available to other teams that are trying to run things other than just the application. Very good. And then Jonah, why don't you give us some thoughts on the impact on networking that the cloud native change has, uh, has created? 
Yeah, I mean, I would say that as people really decompose and change their applications, that uh, networking is pretty considerably because people want to have this software defined control of what's happening in their networks. So folks have really moved from being locked into one particular vendor's perspective into really wanting programmable flexibility. So you saw that, uh, you know, initially start and we'll talk a little bit about this, um, you know, as we go forward, start as attempts to build certain types of uh, programmable infrastructure. But as we move to public cloud, everyone started to see the advantages of, of being able to have that flexibility in their networks. And uh, now that's, that's sort of permeated as SD-WAN, where folks are sort of overlaying new technologies on top of the old. Um, and really providing new uh, ways of managing their their infrastructure and their applications. Um, you know, for folks that are looking at monitoring or visibility, it presents a lot of new data sources and a lot of new techniques for collecting data that we'll also talk about. So networking, I think, is really starting to evolve just uh, in, in uh, concert with the way that applications are evolving in that users uh, are expecting certain things to be exposed and certain data to be available from these new network, uh, you know, new network uh, technologies. So it's uh, exciting times for those of us that are in the uh, business of collecting and analyzing data for sure. Right, sounds, sounds like lots of automation, software definition, flexibility, you know, kind of re-architecting the whole stack. Um, and trying to make things faster and easier and quicker. Uh, big impact both on you know, the dev side and the ops side, so uh, very interesting. Why don't we move now to talking about a key element of the whole cloud native movement, which is open source. Now we know this is really essential to, open, to cloud native architectures, but let's talk about some of the impact and the interaction that o open source software, OSS, has with things like networking. Um, Avi, can you share some thoughts on, uh, you know, where we are with open source software in, in the networking space? Sure. I think we're doing very well with lots of room for improvement. Um, as, the, as with standards, uh, the wonderful thing is there are so many to choose from. There's a lot. There is a plethora and diversity <laughs> in open source. I think it's worth recognizing and celebrating that um, some things like config monitoring we've actually been doing since the 90s granted a uh, really awesome and neat config differ um, what we've always wanted is the opposite of rancid the make it so command the network ci cd the what i want to do and then make it so and intent um, you know ansible as a component uh, that's most commonly used i, I think at, at the networking layer um, but all the orchestration systems that are used for servers uh, all the config management systems we see to some extent um, in networking as well. What's new, of course, controllers um, and you know the whole concept of OpenFlow and what that led to is interesting. On the other hand, the control, open source controllers are way behind even NSX in terms of actual in production deployment. We'll talk about that. Why some reason why that might be? We talk about automation. A um, lot of activity, API, everything, which 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 enables open source. Um, and, um, you know, that's been really great. And then just the ability on, from servers to abstract the networking stack and the container world to make more overlay, more NSX and controller style. Um, wh what I think we have a lot of room to go on is in terms of real CI CD, tying that, orchestrating virtual copies of our network, integrating that with traffic, having that integrated with the application side, um, uh, you know, because automation. Uh, does not necessarily mean simplicity. And as you want to test these things in a complex environment, um, you know, uh, the networking people ultimately have to make it all go. So we're doing well. We're not as far behind as some people think, but there's a lot of room to, to go um, in the networking world. Yeah, interesting. So certainly there's various different sort of rates of adoption in different areas. What are you thinking about? I mean, it, seem, it seems like there's networking is at a different point with respect to open source than server infrastructure and application you know, areas. Uh, what do you think are the real differences between these? I'll hand this to Jonah, actually. Okay, Jonah. Cool. 
Um, so I sort of have found an interesting pattern uh, emerge here, which is when you go back maybe 10 years to when, you know, Red Hat was uh, becoming prominent and an important vendor in open source and a real component behind Linux, which uh, one could argue is the underpinning of much of the open source out there. Um, you know, th that company sort of provided a, a safe haven for large enterprises and service providers to go to one place to license and get support on these open source technologies. You fast forward to today and now a lot of that innovation in open source and, and in cloud native comes from companies like Netflix and Google and, uh, you know, and Microsoft and various others that, that have started to contribute greatly to open source and really create high quality um, what I'll call packages of, of different open source projects that are easier to use and more easy, easily supported. The challenge in networking is that you have a lot of really small little piece parts, almost similar to the way that Linux was before we decided to package all of this open source technology, the different binaries that we use inside Linux around the kernel uh, which today one could argue uh, Kubernetes is the the kernel essentially of the modern um, you know orchestrated environment. So you know I think that with the work that's happening in the community, driven by a lot of these large players, hopefully we'll have a more packaged kind of solution out there, and and hopefully networking will start to be incorporated. We've seen a few little pieces get brought into Kubernetes in terms of having some overlay networks but nothing that really goes all the way down, uh, you know, to managing the network itself. But, you know, it could happen. I don't think it's going to be driven by the networking vendors. They clearly would like to still sell a lot of hardware. Um, but I think the software companies and the innovators, um, you know, may start to really give some of that back to the community. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, interesting. Certainly <clears throat> some of the effort to do this, was first realized in the whole concept of uh, of software defined networks and SDN and 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 you mentioned uh, you know SD WAN earlier it's a variant uh, Avi mentioned uh, you know Open Flow but you know things like Open Daylight you know what what has been the the barrier to to that being exactly what you described in terms of the you know the the opportunity to sort of uh, bring open source to the networking world. Avi, I'll pass that one on to you since this is more near and dear to your heart. <laughs> You're muted, by the way. Let me fix that. I, I think it's a, it's a tool um, and it's not a system the way NSX is, the way it's integrated into the VMware ecosystem. So like most of the things that are available to networking people today, it's something that you can build on and it's been great for people making offerings even some larger enterprise that have very specific ways that they want to operate, that they don't want to have to get other people to implement for them. But um, even though, um, uh, you know, OpenFlow and some of the things that have led to that predate some of the more modern orchestration being available in the application world, we haven't seen it in our customer base across a few hundred enterprise and service providers um, as much as the commercial tools or as much as piece point. We don't see as much WAN control. We see some data center side, um, but the commercial vendors in the, uh, actually the virtualization and cloud world have done a better job than the network vendors of commercializing this, or at least getting it deployed into the field today. Okay, yeah, makes sense, makes sense. So uh, an effort, but incomplete, still work to be done. Uh, we gotta keep looking at better ways to do this. It sounds like cloud native will bring an opportunity to re-examine this. Yeah. And, you know, talking along these lines, though, also in a broader sense, um, there does seem to be a big difference in adoption. Uh, you know, Joni, you mentioned Kubernetes uh, between the, the whole, the first sort of open approach to, you know, to container networking and into changing uh, service architectures that was OpenStack and, and now getting to Kubernetes. So I'm curious on your, uh, to hear your thoughts on, you know, why there really has been such a big different effective adoption and deployment between these two, OpenStack, you know, first and now Kubernetes is, is coming along as a, as a much more predominant sort of and successful alternative. 
So I, I think that this again gets to, you know, uh, the CNCF is part of Vonix uh, foundation itself. I think this gets to the, the sort of the, the, the differences um, uh, between uh, the sort of the Linux side, the server side and the networking side. Um, you know, we have more than a dozen customers that run OpenStack, but every single one of them has hired, had to hire developers, do a lot of integration, sort of like, uh, uh, sort of like, you know, people need to do if they want to do WAN or their own data center control using a lot of open source technology. And I think it's just, there's been a benevolent, uh, probably dictator is the wrong word, but guide architect on the Linux side to say, this is what it is and this is what it isn't. You know, OpenStack, I think, suffers, suffered from five different components that you could pick and choose from to do any one thing. And Google having said, mm -hmm. we have this vision of how orchestration can work for containers, we're gonna get it out there. And then even though it's no longer Google, there's been a pretty tight crew of people to hold to the vision. And we've seen a lot of innovation, a lot of choice about container networking and things like that. But in terms of the, the orchestration and what goes in and what doesn't, I think that's been um, a great help that, that there's been that kind of guide. So it's an interesting question for the community, what's the right level of freedom uh, and innovation versus uh, simplicity of consumption? And that's something I think that uh, even CNCF's dealing with, um, you know, in terms of the number of projects that go in across multiple different layers. And yeah, you know, and I, you know, I, just to add to that, I think it's, you know, Istio as a package of a few different core components, I think is a big been a good uh, way to bring these things together and create a supportable thing that gets released together. And I think that's sort of going to continue expanding out the same way that Linux became like a full-fledged system that consisted of all these different piece parts. Um, there was an interesting question that actually came in uh, from the Q&A that I also wanted to address, which is around um, the, the question specifically from Rahul was around uh, cloud technologies and open source applied to security. So we were mm -hmm. going to touch on this a little bit uh, just because we do definitely see some security use cases for, you know, the type of visibility that we deal with at Kentic. But, um, you know, I largely see security as there, there being still that silo, unfortunately. And even though there's been a lot of uh, talk and discussion around uh, DevSecOps and different ways of bringing security and operations together. Uh, I would say that we ha haven't really seen that fully take shape uh, the way that it needs to happen. So similarly, the security aspects in, in open source and tools specifically for security tend to stay in that silo. The one big difference is that in Istio and in some of these other systems where you have to deal with authentication, you do see those services come in. And one could argue that those are security services. So, um, you know, I think in, until we get more generalists that are well versed in security and understand the fundamentals, I think there's still going to be, you know, some silos. Um, Avi talks a lot about an, an open source tool called Bro that people use and how it has so many applications in in performance and, and operations, but it tends to still be siloed in, you know, that security world. So uh, it's, it's an interesting observation for sure. Yeah, I mean, we could spend a whole nother hour probably talking about uh, security as an element of, of cloud native and cloud native architectures. Sounds like a good topic for a future uh, panel. <laughs> Yep. Well, let's keep things moving here. Let's talk about now what can be done about trying to adopt and adapt uh, practices for dealing with cloud native deployments. And in particular, let's talk about some of the observability and monitoring sort of concepts. So, uh, Jonah, you know, we've had a lot of convergence and improvements on the, the ways that uh, we can apply the traditional practices of metrics and logging and tracing and things um, to, uh, you know, to, this to these environments. Um, so what do you think are, you know, some of the, you know, some of the key practices here and, and, and how are they applicable? How are they being applied and how can this bridge the gap? Yeah, so I mean, we, we definitely do see folks that want to take a look at their traffic um, in, in accordance with their other data that's coming in to various metric logging and logging systems. So 
uh, for example, you know, in, in our specific instance, we have customers that adopt a lot of the open source technologies, Prometheus and Grafana, for example, and they want to see their network data and other data inside of things like Grafana, and they want it to be integrated. Um, and similarly, there are definitely folks out there that would like to see their network platforms collecting other data, whether it's metrics that are not necessarily from network devices or seeing logs from other systems together. But no one's really built that linkage between the two pieces. And I think that the key to that is really tracing. And when I say tracing, I mean both, uh, you know, the open source tracing technologies and also the commercial uh, APM vendors and the way that they do tracing. But uh, being able to see an application trace or an application topology overlaid on top of a network topology, I think is, is really one of the holy grails out there that would unlock a lot of uh, additional context for the networking team and would unlock a lot of visibility for the uh, developers and DevOps teams to understand how that traffic is flowing. So it's definitely an area that I think is, um, you know, is, is going to evolve uh, along with, with a bunch of new standards that uh, we'll touch on in a few minutes. So. Yeah, I, I would add to that. I think the, you know, the challenge has always been understanding the relationship between the various different overlays, the virtual overlays in the network to, uh, which can be, you know, multiple and then tying that back eventually to the actual physical transports, because all of those elements have to be working together to achieve, you know, the best and most reliable performance for the applications. Yeah, and especially uh, in, an, in an increasingly or almost entirely encrypted world, we just, you know, it was clear when we started Contig, you just weren't going to be able to do this from Packet. Packet has value uh, in many places, but to give complete application visibility and decode everything and run a distributed orchestrated world, it was just, was never going to be, um, you know, a sufficient way. Um, so it'll be exciting to see, you know, how these things develop. Yeah, interesting. You mentioned uh, that encryption as a, as a factor as you know, preventing old traditional approaches to being used here. In fact, why don't we sort of bridge that into some of these concepts of being, um, you know, observable when it comes to the network and the network, network components within the cloud native world. You know, what do we need to think about to establish that kind of observability? Avi, do you have thoughts on that? Sure. So, you know, it is a hipster term, observability. Uh, however, if you Google network observability, you find that it basically means being able to understand the state of a network. Now, they don't mean our kind of network. They mean electrical network. But um, <laughs> and so okay. um, in a distributed environment where you can't do packet everywhere, in an orchestrated environment where it's knowable what things are, but they may only exist for seconds at a time, um, it really, to me, observability is how do you architect and think about being able to get the data from your layer and across layers, and then monitoring is the act of actually how you do it, which I think is people are converging on as a definition. And so for me, it's about architecture. It's about how do you make sure that everything that's orchestrated, um, you know about and is available to be integrated? How do you make sure that the different teams um, participate and collaborate at this uh, across the stack, as you were saying, Jim, with all the overlays and underlays and orchestration systems? and how do you, um, you know, as you scale up and scale down, as you provision and deprovision, how do you make sure that your service monitoring, your traffic monitoring, your config monitoring, all of those things are done? Because if what happens is you have a group over here doing that, and then someone's trying to actually do the act of monitoring this whole system, and it isn't designed in, it just creates, it's, it's, a, it's a severe kind of technical debt um, that winds up hurting things, and then also you think you have a complete view, but it turns out you don't. Um, we're never going to be perfect. We're never getting the complete state of it, but it really needs to be part of architecture. And um, you know, about half our enterprise companies are, 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 are web scale content provider SaaS companies, and we ourselves, that's sort of a foundational principle that's helped a lot, is designing um, for this kind of, of observability so that you can monitor the system. Yeah, so related to that, let's go a little deeper on that and talk about then how we translate these these objectives, the very, very important objectives into, you know, good practices for monitoring and operating. Um, Jonah, do you have thoughts on that that you could share? 
Yeah, so I mean, I would say that one of the challenges that we have as we decompose applications is that the complexity increases and so does the scale. And so even a simple movement from a monolithic type of application to a microservices application has a lot of implications uh, in monitoring and operating, and it means both scale and analytics. Uh, and this sometimes means how do we scale our monitoring systems along with uh, those systems that we're monitoring, but it also could mean uh, maybe we have to look for a service that gives us the things that we need that can scale in, in the manner that we need. So I think it's important to understand what you want to build and engineer yourself and what you want to essentially outsource or have someone else build and manage for you. And whether you're using a public cloud provider and you use their services or you use a third party, it, it's important to make the right decisions around what it is that you want to operate and what it is that you want someone else to operate for you. Uh, when it comes to monitoring, it's about integrating it into your system. So in a cloud native world, that's more about being able to automatically monitor systems as you deploy things. Uh, you want to have configuration uh, for monitoring that's checked in with your code base and you want to have the flexibility to collect a lot of different types of this fundamental data together. Um, and so these are some of the things that are, are critical uh, when it comes to, to cloud native type uh, applications and monitoring and operating those well. So interesting that you mentioned automation. Let's talk about, let's kind of drill into that a little bit more because it's so key. I mean, automation is essential, I think, to the whole concept of cloud native and moving to a more uh, dynamic sort of responsive and effective uh, infrastructure for IT or applications. So let's talk about automation now specifically to uh, as it relates to the networking vendors. So I, I'm curious to hear sort of uh, what we think the, the promise has been. I, Avi, do you want to start this one off? Sure, and, and this gets leaks with another question that we have lined up about what we're seeing at the trade shows, but the yep. promise of closed loop automation, um, the reality, I think, um, is more RPA for CLI. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and put up the second for, question. For, <laughs> for things one would do. Um, so it's a little bit further behind um, whether, just like the open source side is, um, it's a little bit further behind um, than I would say the cloud native application orchestration side is. Yeah. Um, and I think that part of that is because, you know, is because the traditional vendors have um, uh, things they do, and I'd call out Cisco with TELF, now the network services orchestrator, which has remained multi-vendor but still when you look at each of the each of the vendors they're trying to have the I, rather than lock in we would say the richness of their own ecosystem uh, you know exposed um which you know sort of is the same as on the cloud side when you look at when you look at those things so um what we see is a lot of the things turning things up turning them down deprovisioning them um and people starting to think about load balancing or scaling are eminently doable um, but I don't, and some of those workflows that are very specific, like scaling a Wi-Fi mesh, vendors have some pretty good in ecosystem solutions for, right. but, we're, but um, uh, you know, we haven't seen those get adopted in broad uh, multi-vendor uh, ways. Jonah, any other thoughts from, from your, yeah, your turn? I mean, the, the one other, I guess, challenge with, with this, and you know, there isn't really a good solution, is if you have a traditional network and you're building some new cloud native applications, trying to manage these things together and automate configuration management across them is, is pretty much impossible because you've got these vendor tools that are specific to their technology then you have some legacy network configuration tools that essentially automate the command line. And then you've got the modern, you know, Puppet, Chef, Ansible network automation tools that people want to move towards. And so the challenge that you run into, just like monitoring itself, is that you end up with a fragmented view and fragmented right. stacks. And there's no real good solution to this today. Um, maybe the answer is overlay over time but it's a, it's a big challenge and a big problem. There's, there's no question there. So. Certainly, I think this is what has given rise to, you know, the popularity of virtual network overlays is yep. need to be able to automate, but 
the inability to do that effectively directly with the traditional, you know, hardware based networking vendors. Yeah. Good. Um, let's, let's uh, t talk about kind of very recent experiences last week. Um, I know you, you, you gentlemen were uh, at a couple of trade shows talking to people about what their experiences have been. Uh, I was at Cisco Live myself, uh, but we'll talk about Nanog as well. This is a service provider community. Um, and and uh, Jonah, I think you were at your first Nanog. Uh, Avi, you were there shortly too. It's, uh, you probably lost count of how many have gone, but Jonah, what, what did you hear uh, you know, from your viewpoint at Nanog and, and did you have any takeaways you can share? Yes. There? relevant for today's discussion. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is my first Nanog, uh, and, it, and it's really the network operations community um, that, that run large-scale interconnected networks, essentially, or service providers. And, um, you know, I think that there was definitely a lot of interest in, in many of these new emerging standards um, and a lot of movement towards uh, newer technologies to, to deal with automation. But mm -hmm. uh, one thing that really struck a chord with me or was sort of interesting at the show was the amount of uh, security folks that were uh, not looking at traditional security, but looking at DDoS and looking at ways that uh, networks can become unavailable. And it was an interesting observation that people that deal with DDoS uh, are, they say, I work in security, I'm focused on security, but uh, to, to me and to many of us at Kentic, we really believe that DDoS is an availability problem. Someone is taking away my network services. Mm -hmm. And so it was interesting just to see, um, you know, to see that uh, perspective and how many folks were concerned with it. But then on the other hand, there's a lot of new standards to try to fix some of these DDoS uh, issues, whether it's um, you know, doing better filtering on, uh, on, on packet sources themselves or signing BGP when it comes to routing uh, that could solve a lot of the hijacking and various issues that we see that uh, make networks unavailable. Um, and the adoption is very minimal in those areas. So it's... Uh, it's sort of like people acknowledge the problem, but they don't really want to do the work to fix the problem. Um, so it was kind of, uh, it was a bit strange for sure, but, uh, but eye opening. I think there are some, some great new standards, you know, that we'll touch on in, in the next section that folks are very interested in. Definitely. Though. Very good. Yeah. Uh, Avin, any thoughts on Nanog from you? Um, I, I would agree it was interesting to see um, a, a lot of people paying attention to what's happening in the open source and the orchestrated world. Um, I would call out maybe last Nanog where there was a presentation about an open source system called Batfish, which is looking at network mm -hmm. validation. <clears throat> I, I still yeah. think that um, we need in the networking world maybe emulation. Um, we tend to move so fast and abuse vendors to, at, to implement anything randomly um, uh, even at the cost of complexity that um, every practicing network engineer I've ever talked to has found, you know, serious bugs in the equipment. So pure mathematical validation, validation by itself isn't there, but that general approach and making that available is pretty, uh, is pretty interesting and exciting. People are definitely thinking about, uh, thinking about how is the world changing and how can they, how can they participate and work across groups. Um, that said, it's still a, a relatively siloed, uh, siloed environment that's very focused on the interconnection and, and the issues related to that. Okay. Well, any any threads about cloud native coming through the Nanon community? Not as much. Not as much that I've seen. And I think it, it comes from a frustration that uh, I have had and Jonas had as well that in that community, even though there's a, a plethora of sources of data about performance, yeah. period fundamentally done based on traffic volume, not performance. Mm -hmm. Even though people have logs from the client or they have other things, and I think it's partly the fault of vendors, partly the fault of, I mean, it's, there's a lot of different reasons why um, it hasn't really been materialized, but it's something we're certainly hopeful that, that uh, uh, we can help in working with our customers to change. Okay. Well, I want to talk about Cisco Live, which was the other you know, big event happening last week, and a lot of networking folks there. Um, Avi, what, what did you, uh, what did you hear and, you know, what, what were your observations? So I saw lots of AI discussion, um, lots of confusion about what that means. 
um, whether it's uh, AI, AI ops, um, aut automation in particular, a lot of promise of yeah. AI to automate, but if you go to each of the presentations, um, they're actually about robotic process automation using a set of scripts that you can do. Um, it's not a system configuring and, and the whole network auto dynamically running, except for specific um, workflows. So that's great, um, but we are definitely in, in, in a hype cycle there. There was less cloud native than I would have thought, um, except that um, you can run um, your containers with your components um, like some of the other switch vendors, white box vendors have done uh, you know, in the past. You can now do that on, on pretty much all the major vendors and this was Cisco, so you could do it in Cisco, so that was good. Less, I think, um, people seem to be either uh, brownfield or greenfield. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, talking about a new way of being without figuring out how you bring everything in or more focused on some of the more traditional uh, infrastructure. And what really struck me last year Cisco Live was all the DevNet, all the, everything with Python, everything you could automate was overflowing. It was a little bit more subdued. They had the area on a different section. Um, and I went to some of those panels and again, it was more, here's a library, here's something, here's a workflow you could automate. Um, and generally everyone that I talk to, the assumption is you need to know APIs, you need to do something, know something about scripting. But I think there's an increasing awareness that the network people are still going to have to understand all the networking stack to do debugging of this increasingly complex world. So right. uh, off the hype, but that's usual at trade shows, at com big commercial trade shows, whether it's security or IT. Um, and you know, the state of the art is advancing year over year. Right. You know, I think it sounds like, uh, my, my own observations at Cisco Live, it, it sort of reemphasizes what we were talking about earlier, which is there's still not a really tight alignment with the, you know, the core traditional networking community with what cloud native means in the changing environment cloud native. A lot of interest in that, you know, trying to understand it, but, uh, but there's not a lot of uh, like product and solution oriented, you know, um, storylines yet from, from those, those sort of communities. Um, <clears throat> Great. Well, let's move on to the last section here and let's talk a little bit about sort of uh, where we are and kind of where we're headed with respect to, to networking. And again, thinking about this in terms of the impact on cloud native, you know, what, what's happened happening so far in 2019 and, and what do we think uh, has been most impressive? Um, uh, Jonah, do you want to start off with your thoughts here? Yeah, sure. I just have a couple of key areas that I think are, are changing quickly and particularly interesting uh, when it comes to open source and opening the data. So there's a, a new standard open telemetry that's starting to pick up steam and it's sort of bringing together open tracing and, and some of the other work that's been done in open census by Google and Microsoft and various others. So that's really creating a new standard for tracing, logging, and metrics, and, and we'll see where that goes. It's early. Uh, I think there's some interesting work in the semantic logging area where we're trying to standardize on logs. This has been mm -hmm. going on for roughly two decades, but uh, we might be making some progress at this point. Um, you know, and I think the uh, understanding of topology is another key area that I, I believe that there are some ad advancements happening in um, and from our perspective, it really gives us additional data to collect and analyze. And, uh, you know, hopefully these standards uh, move forward, become certified, and, and vendors uh, implement them. So, um, Agreed. Uh, Avi, has anything impressed you particularly so far in 2019? Just that we are um, definitely in the open world, and uh, the attitude is, has really fully shifted. Um, and again, I think there's a lot of work that that exposes, but it's great that we're in a time where um, you can understand not just the theory of everything, but really interact with things at a much lower level in networking if you need to, whether it's for debugging or for, for architecting or for operating. Um, and that attitudinally, people are realizing what that opens up um, for every enterprise and service provider. So I think that's, that's it's definitely, um, uh, impressive uh, uh, versus 10 years ago. Very good. Well, let's talk about sort of hype versus reality. Is there anything that's kind of uh, overhyped in 2019 uh, that, that you've been running into? Jonah, your, your thoughts? Um, I mean, I would say that uh, 
everyone is talking about AI without really concrete understanding of what you're applying it to and what problems you're solving. So um, I would say that there's definitely always hype words and not clear, uh, you know, not a clear understanding of what those, those hyped words are going to do for me or my particular organization. So, uh, you know, I think that that's, uh, you know, continues to be a challenge. Um, definitely AI and blockchain come up a lot, um, even though we have our first real cryptocurrency just, just got announced by Facebook. So we'll, we'll see what happens with that. AI is PowerPoints and machine learning is Python, right? So there you um, go. <laughs> so you, you would agree, Avi, any, any other things you're seeing hyped, Avi? Uh, yeah, I think that telemetry has been great but the hype factor is off the charts. We have zero customers that are ready to turn off SNMP. It's sort of like the hype factor we had for over V6, but no one's actually turned off V4. Um, yeah, I think IP V4, yeah. some good things there, but if you look at all the presentations on telemetry, it follows this theme of, it's this really cool thing, and you can put it in either Prometheus or Influx and do whatever you want with it, Grafana, but it's not as much sort of guided how you put all that together. And I think that some of that is for the vendors to do and some of that is for the open source community to do. And it's awesome that it's open and available, but um, the perception is this is really key to the modern networking and, and, and fundamentally most modern networks are, are, are you know, collecting it, but not using. Uh, by this, I mean the, the SNMP alternate of machine. Uh, yeah. yeah. You're talking about streaming telemetry, the streaming sort of model-based streaming telemetry. Yeah. Yeah, publish and subscribed as opposed to the polling-based approaches, right? And it's hard to say that P4 is only hype, given that Intel just bought uh, Barefoot. Um, but um, yeah. there's a lot of activity, a lot of thought. But um, some of the operational pieces have to come together about how this actually works if people are going to be pushing code into the forwarding plane. Uh, but we're very excited about it from the perspective of getting inline network telemetry, which actually can give you some performance data about the infrastructure. But again, we don't see it's a lot of hype. A lot of people are buying switches, but we don't see the packets going through those uh, those planes today much. Now, how about when we talk about cloud native and the concept of container networking? You know, what is the sort of uh, metric and, and telemetry options uh, for for getting data out of the the service meshes? Well, the service mesh is awesome, um, especially, you know, Envoy's had the ability to send that telemetry, but Istio has a pluggable architecture. Um, and then we've actually done integrations around that. Um, at the container networking level, the telemetry is actually pretty weak. It's been a big issue for a lot of our customers who don't necessarily always own the OS image, that there's no traffic telemetry that's a standard way of coming out. It's not in Calico or Weave or, or I'm, I'm, excuse the five other ones that I didn't name. Um, but there is an increasing understanding that there needs to be a standardization of that, of the, of the tunneling infrastructure, if there is it, or natting, um, mm -hmm. so that you can debug these things down to the lowest level. So that, that part's been actually more exciting at the service mesh level than at the container networking level uh, recently. Got it, yeah. Uh, well, let's do the last one here, which is, what are you looking forward to? What do you see as evolving that's gonna, really going to be powerful uh, in the next 12 months? Um, Jonah, we'll let you kick it off. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I kind of, uh, as I said before, I think some of these, these new standards are particularly interesting and, and will pay close attention as they sort of go through the W3C and, and other things. Um, you know, and how long it takes to get them implemented both by, uh, you know, browser manufacturers um, all the way down to public cloud providers and, and how they expose this data. So uh, I think for us, it's, it's more data, more places that we can correlate data together as, a, as an analytics company. And, uh, you know, just providing a deeper and, and better visibility, generally speaking. Um, I do think it's going to be interesting to see if the overlay situation gets more solidified. Um, you know, if there's better guidance in, in things like Istio in terms of what should be in there and what shouldn't be in there um, to hopefully make some of the decisions easier. Uh, if you were looking at the Q&A, a lot of the questions are, what should I use? What's the right bet to make? And 
And I think users are generally confused because, you know, as Avi stated, there's 16 different overlays for Kubernetes. There's probably six popular ones. And what if I pick the wrong one? <laughs> uh, so these are the challenges that everyone's dealing with is, you know, what's the right thing to do and what's the right thing to pick. And I don't want to be on the wrong side of the coin there. Um, so these are, you know, some of the constant challenges that, that folks need guidance on. Yeah, not, not unusual for this stage of evolution or maturity in a, in a new area. There's a lot of choices and they do tend to settle out over time. Avi, yeah. what are your thoughts? Anything else you're looking forward to uh, in the next year? Sure. And, and I just want to say um, I, we're talking about how much of a challenge this is, but it's actually a really exciting time uh, to be doing infrastructure. Um, you know, in the 90s, uh, when I was an ISP, we'd wake up and never know what, what the next thing was. ISDN, web, web design, uh, lease lines, everything else. And I think that, that for the right mindset folks, this is a time of great uh, opportunity and, 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 and enjoyment and evolution. Um, but um, it creates challenges as well. Uh, what I'm looking forward to is, is finally seeing some um, use cases come out of, of streaming telemetry or people shutting up about it. Um, I think we'll see the former, uh, but with more tempering of understanding that it's not 10x more magical than SNMP. Um, uh, and I also hope that we'll see the intermediate step, which is people actually taking SNMP, pulling it once, sticking it into a bus, operating in modern ways with it, um, and then integrating the pieces of the, the model-based tel telemetry uh, some more. And then um, just also, as Jonah said, more cross-stack integration. Um, the more we see uh, Istio deployed in our customer base, um, the more the richness of traffic data can be exposed with performance. Um, and you can do the same with open source, you can do it with monitoring vendors, but as a methodology, that uh, kind of telemetry coming up and, up and down the stack and being integrated, um, I think will be much further along in 12 months than we are today. Yep, excellent, excellent. Well, great, hey, thanks Avi and Jonah both for your time, your insights. It's a very interesting and exciting time and there's a lot happening. We have a few minutes left in uh, our session here for questions. So just a quick reminder, if you have any, please drop them in the Q&A tab. And uh, we'll, 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 I think we have time for three or four perhaps. Um, uh, Jonah, do you see, uh, are you able to see the questions list? Uh, anything you can pick up and answer? Yeah, definitely. Um, I was just looking through a couple of these. Um, I guess this one was particularly interesting. It, is the network operations person or role uh, or even the architecture role becoming outdated with the rise of generalists? Will there be fewer? Um, maybe pass this one to Avi and see what he thinks just because uh, more, even more his background than mine. Uh, well, what do you think about that one, Avi? So I was at Onug sitting next to Russ White and he was the one that said, I don't know if he originated it, um, automation does not mean simplicity. One of the things that has been the hallmark of the network uh, architect, operator, engineer, is sort of like physics. You need to be able to reason from first principles or you'll be hopelessly lost because there's enough bugs that you interact with and enough complexity that, again, since there was networking, it was an issue. And I think that the role of the network operator is changing. You're going to be operating things that you can't rewire because they, they're as they were, things that you can get involved in the design and architecture of. Um, and you're, you're battling in a world where people think the network is just APIs. But what we're seeing is over time, people realize that no matter how orchestrated and how much you have um, you know, tunneling and orchestration in your infrastructure, things sometimes don't work and the role of the network operator is key because there are just some principles that are lost on, um, lost on uh, people that don't study networking. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's incumbent on us, uh, and I'll say that as a network operations, to provide value and context and speak not in IP addresses, uh, but in terms of application and impacts to the business. <clears throat> Um, that's actually what gets you funded for all the cool toys that you want, whether they're open or vendor specific or hardware or monitoring um, or anything like that. So again, I think it's an exciting time and I think that the networking heroes are in many ways 
the, the heroes of the cloud migration and the cloud native migration, because if we didn't have that underpinning, uh, people wouldn't be able to orchestrate up at layers above. Um, we have a little bit of a PR challenge, uh, but we also have a little bit of an evolution challenge, which is what we're talking about. So with the right ha mindset on, it's, it's exciting, um, uh, even as it is also daunting. Um, and, and on that note, uh, there's one question that came in here and, and it says, uh, when I'm on the public cloud, why do I need networking tools? Doesn't my cloud provider handle it for me? And so touching on that same note, uh, I mean, the network, even if you're migrating your data center to public cloud or at least great portions of it, you know, I, I still see a great uh, demand for having the right tooling, not just to ma manage your uh, campus network and your internet connectivity, but as we adopt the cloud, it actually puts a lot of pressure on existing internet connect connectivity along with the network itself. And, you know, those that don't manage and think the network is this uh, infinitely scalable resource, uh, you know, you're, you're often reminded uh, that you do need to manage your capacity and you do need to manage your costs when it comes to those things. So uh, having the visibility, not just inside the cloud provider, but uh, in between you and that cloud provider is critical for those business services. Um, and additionally, most of the cloud provider tooling uh, is not efficient enough to really understand uh, how traffic is flowing, uh, especially when you're dealing with multi-region or multi-cloud provider environments. So these are definitely reasons why you should have some type of visibility, even if you're on public cloud and not just leave it up to the provider. When you do have issues, you're also gonna have to hold them accountable. And by having your own data and collecting that data and analyzing it, it arms you with, uh, you know, with the ability to have those discussions with providers and service providers, um, you know, when, when issues do occur, uh, which they will. So Avi, did you wanna add anything on, on yeah, that? I would call out honorable mention to Google. Um, but as we talked about one of the questions about metrics and logs, they take a very metrics and logs approach with, uh, with Stackdriver for that. And, um, uh, you know, at Amazon, you're forbidden from mentioning that there are other clouds. Uh, <laughs> um, and at, uh, you know, Google, Microsoft have more awareness, but Google's taken an open approach, but they don't have the kind of network primitives um, that networking people need to do some of the things we're talking about yet. Um, the thing I would call out, though, also that we love about Google is they have done one very advanced thing, which is putting performance data from TCP observations from their controller into the network telemetry and making it very, you know, five seconds, 30 seconds versus minutes, uh, which it is on other clouds. Um, so that's great. And also networking people, a lot of the observability world is just learning about sampling but networking people have been running things at very large scale and, and, and doing that efficiently and, and, and well with sampling rules just, that's been one of the complaints we've heard from customers is the cloud logs have been designed for security, but you don't really need every last record to do uh, IT and application operations. And so Google is introducing uh, uh, sampling there too. So that's more telemetry than tools. Um, uh, and I still don't think there's any cloud vendor that, that gives you the, the network back, especially as Jonah said, into your own infrastructure today. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what comes down the pike over the next uh, year and more. Cool. Indeed, uh, we might have time for one more question. Do we uh, have any more? Sure, so there was a question that came in on the topic that we had mentioned here, which is how should an organization implement modern network automation when there is no greenfield network in place necessarily? So. Um, sort of how do you get from point A to point B? And, you know, we did mention that overlays, uh, whether you're looking at an SD-WAN solution or something else to manage the network on top, uh, that is one opportunity to do so. Uh, and there's many different layers where you can implement that SD-WAN. But when it comes to the, you know, configuration itself, it's, it's very challenging. There are several uh, consulting companies I've seen that will help essentially script out your current environment mm -hmm. and sort of teach you and help you move into a more 
um, CI, CD type uh, system based on open source technologies. But I haven't really seen anything particularly compelling that, that really helps people get from point A to point B. Um, Avi, do you have any advice on those looking to make the jump uh, to, sure. to something newer? Yeah. So it may, it, it, I hope it didn't come across as a criticism, but when I talk about what I saw people actually doing, what we've seen at Nanog and Cisco Live and at our customers, it's pick things to do in a concentric circle. So start with provisioning and deprovisioning uh, devices, then add provisioning and deprovisioning links and failing over around maintenance and making sure that everything that gets turned on and turned off is monitored across your entire stack um, on your, you know, on your brownfield infrastructure, but then also obviously on, on your new infrastructure and then break down and evaluate. Um, uh, if you don't believe there's a magic solution, break down and evaluate what are the things that you want to move to beyond that? Is it syn synchronizing some of the application and network orchestration? Is it debug fixed workflows that you have? Um, and that is the state of the art. If that's the world that you're in, that's actually about as advanced as most folks that are not the top five web companies in the world are doing, so. All right, thanks. That's all the time we have today. Thank you once again, Avi and Jonah, for spending your time and sharing your, your insights and knowledge. Um, and thanks for everyone who joined us today. Uh, as Kim mentioned at the top of the hour, uh, we are going to, this has been recorded. The slides and the, and the recording link will be sent to you later today. And thanks for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone potentially on another CNCF webinar in the future. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any further questions or uh, comments. Thank you.